righty, take it away. There we go. All right, thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you Hello, everyone Laura. who's here in attendance. It's great to be here with you. Thank you Juan also for being here. I was thinking mm -hmm. that you could start by just introducing us to the book um, and then we could read just a little bit if you would not mind from the beginning. Um, and then we can, can have a conversation and we'll open up for audience Q and A toward the end of the hour. But I thought we could maybe situate everyone with a little bit of a summary since it's such a such a sure. strange creature. <laughs> sure. Um, well, hi everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you, uh, Laura. Thank you, and easy. Um, um, last last week I was in the states. I could speak English perfectly well, but I've just been here for a week and I've completely forgot how to speak English. So please forgive me. Uh, I don't believe it. It's just kind of. It's just no. Please, please, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. I completely forgot it. But anyway, um, you know, you know perfectly well how much I. I mean, I, I, I'm really. Every time people ask me to introduce myself or introduce one of my books, it's kind of, it's pretty hard, you know. And I know. And I was hesitant. Most people, most people have their own, like you know, you know, little. I don't know, a script or something, notes, and they repeat over and over. I just can't do that. And um, but I would say uh, today was uh, I was surprised to read um, a short um, a review someone wrote in Instagram on Instagram. I don't know, and he defined. I don't know who who this person was, but um, I don't know. So, but he he defined. Uh, the Devil of the Provinces as, a, as an anti-noir book, you know, mm. like mm, not a detective novel, not a not a weird detective novel, but an, an anti-noir. You know, mm -hmm. it's got all the elements. It's got we could say it's got all the elements of a noir book or a detective story. You know, there's an investigation. There's there's been a murder or many murders. We could say uh, there's this weird place. Uh, you know, where, where all the, even the physical laws are kind of, you know, um, transfigured, you could say. Mm -hmm. And um, so the plot is quite simple. It's this biologist who returns home from Europe after living in, in abroad for like 15 years, then he returns home to his hometown, which is a little town, and like a typical little town you can find anywhere in I would say the world, but you know, the globalized world today, like um, with access to all kinds of references, you could say, and goods, and but at the same time, very complex place because it's in the middle of the third world. At the same time, you know, on the global south, so it's a, it's a, it's it's like a very 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 complex place, and so this biologist who enters this this new reality of his. Uh, kind of catches up with his old, mm, you know, old story, but at the same mm -hmm. at the same time, he's just discovering this whole new scenario, political scenario. Like, oh, mm, so he doesn't realize, uh, at, you know, what he's getting into. Like, mm -hmm. and and all of a sudden, he's just in the middle of a great conspiracy, crazy conspiracy in the middle of, of this, you know horrible town uh like nightmare-esque town and well i would say that's it i'm pretty bad at it i i when i said at the beginning so sorry if i <laughs> if i was really bad selling my book <laughs> no 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 that was great and i'm glad you mentioned the the anti-noir um component because i think that was something that really drew me to the book as a reader initially was that kind of subversion of what you might expect out of a classic detective novel and um, we can get more into that and what that means to you formally later but maybe if, if you could just read a bit um, and I'll read a bit of English just a minute or two then we can proceed. Sure, sure. like you want me to read? Yeah, do you do you mind? Like, no, 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 I don't mind. <laughs> I actually have to hear the, the Chilean edition so Oh, great. Um, which is which is a pretty beautiful one actually. Um, wow. Let's see so that cover. What, Let's... Look, 
there's like I don't know, oh, like a flag nice. over there, and you know, little figurines are down there. I don't know what they are. That's great. Anyway. Is this still your um, favorite, though? It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, they have a subtitle here. Ah, they got it right. <laughs> anyway, got it right. Anyway, I'll, uh, um, what do you think about the beginning? Should I read like this? In the beginning of the very beginning sure. of the book. Okay. Yeah. This is the way. This is the way it starts. And um, should I read in Spanish? Yeah. Right. Kind of confused. Okay. Too well. Um, this is the way the book begins. You know. So. Cuando peor pintaban las cosas, le salió el reemplazo en el internado de señorita. La rectora del Instituto de Educación Normal le explicó que la profesora titular tenía un permiso de maternidad y por eso lo habían buscado con cierta urgencia. Echó cuentas. Pagaban mal, eran muchas horas, pero a esas alturas no tenía nada mejor. Estaba recién llegado después de vivir más de 15 años por fuera del país y le habían bastado unas pocas semanas en el sofá de la casa de un amigo en el centro de la capital para darse cuenta de que sus títulos extranjeros no le garantizarían una plaza en ninguna universidad de primer nivel. Las personas como él, con las mismas o mejores credenciales, se habían vuelto una mercancía vulgar. Entonces, resolvió que lo mejor sería rebajar las expectativas, probar suerte en la universidad departamental y pasar una temporada en la casa de su madre. Compró el tiquete de avión más barato que encontró y se despidió de su amigo, el único que le quedaba en la capital, uno de los pocos que le quedaban en el mundo. Se conocían desde la infancia, cuando ambos soñaban con escapar de la esclerosis de su pequeña ciudad, imaginando países remotos. Su amigo le preguntó si de veras le parecía buena idea. Mira, que es una pesadilla, le dijo, pensátelo bien. Aquí te puedes quedar todo el tiempo que haga falta. El biólogo se encogió de hombros y sonrió para que el otro entendiera que la ciudad chica, el casi pueblo, ese lugar conservador y atrasado del que tanto se burlaban para conjurar el estigma de haber nacido allí, finalmente se las había ingeniado para devolverles el chiste. Vuelvo con el rabo entre las piernas, dijo el biólogo, bufo y solemne. Me entrego a mi destino, y su amigo se rió con su risa de animal asustado. No quedaba de otra. Tocaba aprender a respirar por la herida y sonreír sin desprecio, incluso con cierta gratitud, celebrando que el sentido del humor provincial se hubiera revelado al mismo tiempo como una pequeña doctrina determinista. All right. Just when things were starting to look dire, a temporary job came up at the all-girls boarding school. The woman who ran the licensure program explained that there was some urgency since the usual teacher would soon be taking parental leave. He did the math. The pay was bad. So were the hours. But by then, he had no choice. He'd just come back from 15 years abroad, and it was clear within weeks, spent on the couch of a friend right in the capital, that his foreign degrees did not, in fact, guarantee him a top-tier professorship. People like him, with the same credentials or better ones, had become vulgar goods. He resolved to lower his expectations, try his luck at the public college back home, stay with his mother a while. He bought the cheapest plane ticket he could find and said goodbye to his friend, his only one left in the capital, one of a few in the world. They'd known each other since childhood and had dreamed even then of leaving behind the sclerosis of their small city, imagining distant countries. His friend asked if he was serious. Let me remind you the place is a shithole. Don't rush into this, he said. Stay here as long as you need. The biologist shrugged and smiled so the other would understand that the small city, almost village, so conservative and backward that they had to make fun of it constantly just to exercise the stigma of having been born there, had in the end worked out a way of turning the tables. I'm going, but don't think I'm proud of it, the biologist said, tragicomic. I give up, destiny wins. His friend laughed, a scared animal's laughter. There was nothing else to be done. It was time to breathe through the wound, to smile without all that scorn, maybe even with a certain admiration. The provincial sense of humor had shown itself to be more than just that. It seemed it was also a minor determinist doctrine. We'll stop there. It's so strange to read right after you, especially because I know that both of us are so fixated on rhythm and sound. I find 
our delivery styles are quite different. What do you think? <laughs> Um, I think, as as I've, as I've said many times, I think you're you're you know you're just you have this perfect sense of when you should betray my style, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> in order to you know because it's it, it's it, it's fascinating. I think that's the most fascinating thing about translating a text, a literary text, um, which is this kind of you know um, not being absolutely loyal. And at the same time, being absolutely loyal to what to, you know, what the text is asking for, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and you have to be exact. And you, you really know how to betray it, like, um, and you, it, you you do it just perfectly. You kind of create your own way of your own cadence, your own way to say, you know. It's strange, though. I mean, as you were reading, I was thinking, yeah. sh should I be reading more like Juan? Should I be reading with kind of that same? Um, prosody or <laughs> lilt or tone but I you know I couldn't do it because it now has its own sort of cadence in English so I don't know I'm glad to hear that that's a betrayal you approve of <laughs> but I'm glad that we came already to the topic of music because I think that's something that's always been fascinating to me about your work and I know that you're a musician as well um, can you talk about how music plays into your writing practice? I mean, do you listen to particular, is there a Devil of the Provinces Spotify playlist that we should all have as we're reading? Or how do you, how do you unite those two artistic pursuits? Well, I, I don't consider myself a musician. Like I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just a guy who, you know, likes to make sounds and I like in, musical instruments. I have a few, uh, I have a few around here, but you know, anyway, like just, <laughs> for goofing around, you know me. So, um, um, but yes, uh, like music is so important for my idea of how the literature works. And it, it's really important like for me to discover how the book's gonna sound, how the, you know, the tone, the cadence, the rhythm, um, uh, for me, that's, I would say that's, that's like the most important part of the book. Because if, if I can find the sound, I will find the resonance, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, um, if I'm able to find how the book's going to sound, like, uh, in, uh, what the harmony is going to be, what the harmony is going to be, and uh, I will be able to find like, well, well, this, this thing is resonating here. This other thing is resonating here. From both a rhythmical musical way, but also from a you know from a thematical point of view, I would say like uh, and um, so yes, for me that's that's like the the most important part. I would say like I really have to find first of all like from the beginning, um, I have to find the sound. Of the, mm -hmm. I have to find the sound of of, of the voices, how how the narrator is going to sound. And the, the characters are how are they gonna talk? How are they gonna and um and and I was thinking that maybe for the rest of my notes there's a more clear even there's even a I even created a, a, a Spotify playlist for the for my uh latest one for, you for the did? Peregrino Tra. I oh. did, I did. <laughs> I and were did. you writing uh, were you writing while you listened to those songs? No, no, no. I can't do that. I can't do that. I just can't. I can't. Uh, so I, because I get distracted. So I, I end up listening more to music than rather than, than writing. So, um, and, uh, but um, for this one, I don't have a playlist and I'm not very sure what music exactly. I don't remember what, what kind of music I was listening to when I wrote the book. Which is strange now that I think of it, because mm -hmm. for the rest of the books, I really know what kind of music. And there's even references, like very precise references, like musical mm -hmm. references in the middle of the book. Right. Uh, but this one, th there's not a reference for this one, like a very clear one. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't think of it. But but um, I'm always listening to I'm always listening to a lot of. Um, I like I like noise. You know, I like the idea of music close to 
you know, closer to a certain notion of noise. Um, I love I love melodies. I'm a very classical guy in that in that sense. You know, I like I love melodies. But at the same time, I love noise. I, I love how uh, when you start listening to very complex music, I'm listening. I don't know, for instance, I don't know, like Yanis Tenaki or something like that. Or yeah. Ryuichi Sakamoto, Ryuichi Sakamoto, <laughs> <laughs> or any, you know, all those things that you know, highbrow people used to mention. But I, I really, I, I really love that that kind of music, like very, very electronical noise. Um, so I'm always, you know, there's there's this woman I love her, Eliane Radic, who's a French electronic composer. She's mm. incredible. She creates this very very long pieces using um, synthesizers you know and um uh, and there's for sometimes there's just exploring the one note and its resonances and the frequencies mm. surrounding one note and there's like like half an hour doing that but it's incredible it's absolutely mesmerizing and and back in the day when I was, when, when I was thinking of the novel, not writing it, but think, thinking about, you know, all the, you know, preparing the novel and, and taking notes and all that, I used to listen to a lot of Elian Radic. And I really love the way, you know, just let it, just, just, there's something there. You know, it's something which is right there. There is this resonance, this incredible note going on and on and on and on for hours. And it's amazing. She's she's a total genius. I love her. Um, you know, I love I love I love that kind of music. So mm-hmm. but I don't remember exactly what the reference is for now for this book. I'll have to write that down. What's her name once more? Eliane Radic. I'm okay. I'll write it here. Eliane Radic. I'll write it here. Do you read Sorry. your work aloud to yourself? Yeah. Is that always part of yeah. your process? Yeah. That's Especially, one of my favorite parts of translating your work is reading it out loud at the end. Oh, well, yeah. That's good. Um, yeah, I do it all the time because, especially when I have doubts about, when I have doubts about, you know, the sound of a particular character or a particular, you know, mm, I don't know, like, especially when I'm trying to figure out how is gonna, how's, how's the person gonna tell something? Mm-hmm. I like it, I like it, you know, I really like it to sound very natural. Like, like I'm, I'm reading it out loud and you don't, you don't feel like it's artificial or, you know, like juxtaposed, simply just stuck in, uh, on top of it. I don't, I don't like this idea. I, I like the idea of this very organic sound going on and on. And you just don't realize when someone starts talking and when this person just, you know, um, and then the narrator goes back and yeah. anyway, you know, that's, right. but the, sure, sure, it's, sure it's, it's, it's a big deal for me, like waiting aloud. Mm-hmm. Me too. It's always a lot of fun with your books. <laughs> but I was thinking about when you were talking about liking melodies, but also liking noise. I was thinking a lot about the last book of yours that I translated, Ornamental. Now, there are two very distinct voices there. There's the kind of hypnotic Baroque voice of this patient number four. And then there's this more scientific, sardonic voice of, of the doctor who's running her study. And the way those two voices sort of blend together and contaminate each other. Um, And I was thinking about last week when we got to be in Dallas together, you were talking about how one of the things you love most about translation is that idea of contamination um, and how that can kind of expand the possibilities of language. Could you talk more about contamination as a translator and maybe as a writer too? Well, uh, for me, it's always been fascinating to to feel how a foreign language uh, is somehow instilled, even you know, involuntarily. Like like maybe people don't realize when it's happening, but you know, 
noises and rhythms and nuances are coming from a, a foreign language, just all of a sudden they're just part of your own language. And that phenomenon, since, since I was a little kid, it's fascinating. And here in Latin America, we have, we have this very uh, unique phenomenon of, of, of how indigenous languages, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. from Quechua or very mm -hmm. ancient languages from indigenous languages, um, they, they start contaminating the way Latin American people speak Spanish. You know? And you, when, when you train your ear for, for, for this kind of, you know, uh, of contamination, mm -hmm. it's, it's really a very fascinating thing to look at, uh, to witness. Um, I mean, from the very beginning, since I was a little kid, I used to listen to people who came from, you know, very far away regions and came to my grandmother's house. And I was like, this guy speaks weird, you know, what, what kind of an accent, what kind of an accent is that? And it wasn't mm -hmm. just an accent. It was just, you know, his, his, his mother tongue from indigenous languages, just instilling and, you know, kind of contaminating Spanish. And for me, that was like, wow, like, you know, like a very musical experience, you know, you know mm -hmm. in that sense. And that happens all the time. And for me, it's been, you know, I lived, very, I lived for a long time in, in Europe and, and I spent a lot of time living in Spain. And, and it, was, it, it was incredible um, seeing how Latin American accents and Latin American expressions started to contaminate Spanish, uh, Spaniard Spanish, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always been kind of a, you know, an obsession for me to observe this kind of phenomena. Um, and it happens, in, it's happened in, in the States in a very incredible way in the last 300 years, you know? Um, you know, all this influences coming from Italy and from, you know, Ebonics, which is an incredible phenomenon. Uh, or, you know, this, all these things, I, I found them fascinating because we, we often think because of ideology, because of nationalism and, and ideology, we often think of languages as something which just are, are closed systems and closed, closed systems and very hermetic. But they're mm -hmm. not. They're always open. They're open to all kinds of influences and and well, I would say I would say um, English English is a very mestizo language from the very beginning. You know, mm -hmm. it was it's 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 it's, it's Latin, but it's but it's also Anglo-Saxon or Germanic. You know, you have the, this two references all the time. You know, you right. have two words almost for every for every object. You have the Germanic word and the, the Latin word going on mm -hmm. there. So it's it's it, that's fascinating for me. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, I, I think that's part of the, uh, that's part of, uh, you know, mm, what well, for, for, for the things we do, like translating, make, mm, writing books, uh, that part of contaminating things, which are not supposed to get contaminated, which are meant to be separated from any, from a political or an ideological point of view, and also sudden realizing we are not separated, we're just getting together. It's like it makes sense, no? Mm -hmm. It really makes sense. It it for me, it's one of the you know one of the reasons I do this. You know? Me too. Like, like anyway. Were you in Spain or Colombia when you were writing *The Devil of the Provinces*? I was in I was in Colombia. And then I was in Ecuador, in Ecuador, and I finished the book in Chile. Okay. All over. I was thinking about how when I was translating it, I was living in Galicia in northern Spain and how it felt like the wrong place to be translating this book, you know, because it's such a specific region with a, a language of its own um, and how being in that environment, I had to really work to imaginatively travel to Colombia. Um, but you've translated from Portuguese and English, and you're doing that from all over the world. Do you feel like your location in space 
affects your ability to kind of transmit the location in whatever you might be translating or writing. Is that question legible? <laughs> it's legible and it makes perfect sense because as I said before, I really feel like completely forgot my English since last week, you know? Like, <laughs> I really, because in the last few days, I haven't speak, I haven't spoken English to anyone. So it's been like, uh, I've been here talking to, you know, the guy who sells milk to me and eggs and, you know, you know all that kind of, <laughs> of, all those conversations. And all of a sudden, you're just immersed in Spanish and very local variant of Spanish. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's like, I, I can't really speak English. I can't, I can't forget it, you know, like I, uh, or Portuguese, it happens to me. Uh, in the last few years, I've been learning a lot of I I Italian. So uh, I, I, I don't think I speak Italian, when, but when I'm in, it, in Italy, I'm just like a parrot, you know? I'm blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and of course, I think the context got a lot to do because it's, I, I think it's a social experience in the end, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, when you start, you know, moving between languages, it, it's always a social thing. And, um, yeah, of course the context really, um, influence that has an influence or, or I don't know, maybe it determines what you're doing a lot. But anyway, I think you did a great job with the El Diablo in Galicia. So anyway, <laughs> kind of worked out, kind of worked great. out, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, I was in a small town, maybe it was a dwarf city of its own. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the idea of the crime novel, too. I think um, I like to describe the book as a, a kind of exploded detective novel, because I think what appeals to me so much about it, one of the many things that appeals to me is that it kind of um, subverts our expectation for an answer. You know, you start out reading a classic police novel, a detective novel, you're presented with some facts, a mystery, you know that by the end of the novel, the mystery will be solved and you'll have complete certainty about who the villains are, who the good guys are, um, and what justice has been done. So how how does the devil of the provinces kind of explode that idea? And what was your aim in playing with that form? Well, um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, we're we're just surrounded by all these crazy conspiracy theories all the time, almost for everything. Like we are so disinformed right now. Like we, we you know, access to information has become a really, you know, hot topic. I would say, or very, mm -hmm. you know, very polemic one. Um, and I'm saying this because, um, we, we all live in the middle of, of all this uncertainty. We're not very sure if we are being told the truth in nowhere, you know, nowhere. Like, like, whenever you try to see what's happening in the, uh, you know, in a determined part, part of the world, like, I don't know what's happening right now in Niger or what's happening right now in, in Gabon, you know, and with all the school they So what's what, when you started looking for information and you start looking for information, it's like impossible. So you start to compare life. You start mm -hmm. comparing the life, you know, like who's everyone's yeah. lying, but I'm going to, I'm going to compare <laughs> the life, you know, everyone's lying. Like, and I think that's a very, you know, that's, that's like, that's like the way we live or times right now. This is this is the way we live. We live surrounded by conspiracy theories. And I would say conspiracy is one of the structures of how we see or perceive reality. You know, everyone's everyone's playing the wise guy telling each other, oh you are you're a moron. You believe in conspiracy theories. You know, but the fact is we are surrounded by conspiracy theories and conspiracy is kind of determining or the structure, the very structure of our reality is that it's kind of conditioned by this, by this conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the intuitions I had when I started creating this, this whole story. And for me, it was very important to, to locate 
this character in the, um, this this very very smart character uh, who's kind of a detective you know the biologist is kind of a mm-hmm. detective in the, in this for this story and he think he's he think he's a, you know he's a very rational and very you know structured and very cultivated mind i would say but but uh, but all the forces around him political economical religious uh, all these forces are way stronger than him way stronger than his intellect way stronger than his capacity to create pa- patterns or and and you know so he doesn't realize his, uh, all of a sudden he's just in the middle of a conspiracy like what like <laughs> And mm-hmm. and this is what I was looking for, you know, and and I'm actually I'm actually trying to invite the reader to participate of this um, sort of disorienting experience experience. Like uh, so, that was that was the main you know intention I would say for for creating this this narrative structure where you you there's a lot of dead ends like you're like ah this is what's going to happen you know so you have so you build up your expectations and then you just find in a dead end like what really so you have to turn around and you have to look for another uh you know so that's it and and I'm really interested in how from a from a um, from an intellectual point of view, from a, from a cognitive point of view, I'm very interested in how um, detective stories work. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have all these, there's a mystery, there's a guy who solves a mystery, you know, there's this, and restores the order. You know, the order has been restored. Right. He kisses, you know, he got, he's got the money, he gets paid. Yeah, um, you know. Anyway, we we've seen right. many movies. Thing. We know that. You know, you know, we know that. Yeah, and it's. I think it's and a very comforting form, right? It is a comforting. It is very comforting. It's it's very ideal ideological. Like uh, it's it was created for comforting people. Like 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 everything's fine. Detectives and good guys will take care of it, and you know all the supreme order in which you can go to a supermarket or go to the movies or, you know, have a, go for a ride. It's absolutely guaranteed because there's going to be some few smart guys taking care of it, of your reality. Your reality is absolutely safe. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, reality, reality is not safe for anyone. And especially right now with all the things going on in the world right now. And um, so I think it's very interesting to see how, uh, my, well, I, I was trying to, um, I was trying to create a dialogue with a different tradition of detective stories, you know, which is I would I would mention Leonardo Sciascia, who's a very mm-hmm. direct influence, uh, an Italian writer from from the south, um, who's got all these incredible ideas about it, you know, about how mm-hmm. how impunity works in Italy, you know, and um, but also, um, also I would say there's this um, uh, Raymond Chandler stories. I love Raymond Chandler stories, you know, which is kind of an uh, maybe it's an unexpected yeah. uh, reference, but 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 I love I love his stories because um, um, I think he's one of the, you know, he's a very he's like a pioneer, you know, in discovering how capitalism works and how and capitalism works through lies and deceiving and cheating and racketing and all this corruption going on. And he just, he kind of gets into it like, uh, okay, I'm not afraid to look at uh, all this corruption going on around me. And uh, so it, it's, it was a very, you know, I was, I used to read uh, a lot of Raymond Chamber when I was a teenager. Uh, so maybe it just got stuck there somewhere. You know. <laughs> oh, that's great! I didn't know about that influence. <laughs> I love him. If... I really do. It's got, It's kind of. It's kind of. I know it's kind of cheesy to say I like. I like Raymond Chandler, but I really do. <laughs> I think he's <you're> great. <laughs> I'm 
was wondering if maybe it was time for us to take some questions from the audience, unless you have any questions for me. <laughs> if, if if well, let's 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 see. But sure, I have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just as a reminder for the audience, um, the Q and A button it's just on the bottom of your screen there, uh, so you can feel free to pop in a question uh, whenever you'd like. Okay. <laughs> None yet. Yeah, I guess I have a question. Um, when you were talking a little bit about, you know, sort of your influences for the for the books, um, but I'm curious, uh, for both you and Lizzie, you're both translators. Are there any um translators whose work you feel really influences yours, either through their taste or just their their style of translation, anything like that? Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Name all your favorite translators right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's interesting because I don't usually, if I'm reading the translation, I'm not usually comparing it to the original, you know, mm. so it's hard to know what tricks a translator might be yeah. using. I'm only experiencing the final version or in the version, mm. not final, I suppose there is no final version, but I'm only experiencing the version in English. Um, so I'm evaluating it as its own work of art in English. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there are translators who I admire, definitely. But I feel like if I name one, I'll have to name 20. So I might <laughs> not name any. <laughs> um, what about I was, you? I was, I was thinking, I was thinking about, well, I, um, I really love, there's this, there's this Argentinian um, translator and writer, Marcelo Cohen, who just passed away a few months ago. He was a great guy and, and he was also a very, very brilliant uh, writer and translator. He was an incredible translator, actually. And he's, he's, got, he's got this mm, a very short collection of, of essays about translation, which those essays, those essays were really influential for me, like uh, at some point, um, especially because he had a very similar experience to mine. Um, he didn't live in, he, he lived, he lived in Spain for a long time, you know, and for, for during the nineties and early two thousand, you know, um, here in Latin America, the industry, you know, in editing industry, publishing industry was, it was, it was a mess. You know, we had, you know, all these neoliberal transformations and so on and so on. They just created this huge big corporations, destroyed these little ecosystems we had here in, in our countries of small polishing houses and so on and so on. So uh, the only place we could go to, to looking for, you know, looking for, for translations and working as a translator was Spain. Uh, but in Spain, the industry was really reluctant to Latin American translators. They were like, "No, we don't want, we don't want any of your weird sounding, and you know, uh, we don't like it." So it was a complete prejudice because they were just imagining, you know, they created the prejudice in in Spanish audiences, and they were protecting that prejudice. They they were created they mm -hmm. they created themselves. You know what I mean? So for a long time, it was, it was really a struggle for us, like, uh, like, uh, getting into the industry, finding job, finding, uh, you know, good books to translate and so on and so on. It wasn't until the emergence of independent, uh, publishing houses in, 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 you know, 2004, 2005 in Spain and Latin America that all these things started changing. You know, Marcelo Cohen was living there in the nineties. You know, it was it was really the worst, like the worst time for 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 being a translator, a Latin American translator in Spanish in in Spain. And so he's got these very brilliant essays where he reflects on on the fact of being a Latin American doing this job there. You know, and what he had to do, how he had to transform his own language, but at the same time, how how he's gonna act, like you know. Um, Freak Spanish readers into reading something he was trying to, you know, like a yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. That that's this this contraband, you know, yes. smuggling, yeah. smuggling, smuggling Latin American sounding things from 
one side, you know, from one side of the border to the other was just, okay. it was just great. So I, I really feel it, very identified with the, with this kind of activity of a smuggler, like Marcelo Cohen, you know. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that so much. I'm right. I'm translating um, a book for a British publisher right now, and I'm having different but similar problems <laughs> because I'm really trying to, you know, what would a what would a British person say? But it's not just vocabulary; it's rhythm and all sorts of things. So, not quite the same, but similar. <laughs> Yeah, it's very similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the intercontinental differences between, you know, it's ostensibly the same language, but yeah, it becomes yeah. so different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so sure. we've got a question here from Alex for Juan. Um, was there a passage or some facet of Devil in the Provinces that you thought would be most difficult for Lizzie to convey in English? Or by the same token, was there something in the book you were really excited to see what she did with? I, I was I was excited uh, to see what she did with the whole book, um, you know, um, and 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 I wasn't disappointed at all. I, I was <laughs> it was really it was a really great experience reading the book, rereading the book uh, under Lizzie's uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, version. And um, but yes, of course there were there were a lot of passages where I was like. Mm, you know, but it was really afterwards, and especially when I was reading the book, because I knew what what was coming. I was like, "Oh, I wonder what she did with the next chapter." You know, like, and we we last week we were in Dallas. We were talking about this, uh, and uh, and uh, we mentioned a couple of passages that were extremely difficult, and I had forgotten about them. Like uh, all this, uh, you know the. There's there's this character, an uncle who's gone crazy, and he writes a letter to to the biologist, and and I don't know how you did it, but it it was it was really it was really you know it was really hard. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find just because I think the visual, yeah, there's just so much that the uncle is completely losing his mind, and he's writing this letter where different words are kind of combining into one and it has everything to do with how they're spaced and um affecting each other's meanings and that was almost impossible <laughs> almost <laughs> um i'm glad you brought that up because you, it was just you know I, you you have to accept that there will be certain things sacrificed and other things conserved i suppose <laughs> sure 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 <laughs> And um, there's this other part where there's a little fable. Do you remember? It's a machete fable. Mm. You know? um, and and uh, I was really curious before reading it, like um, like um, because that part that's one of the most important part of the whole book. I would say like there's uh, so much condensed in that part of the fable. You know, this this guy tells. A uh, very creepy fable to uh, to the biologist, and and right before reading it, I was really curious uh, about how how would you render the the whole you know pace of of you know how this guy's telling the fable, and it was perfect. You know, oh. the pace was just absolutely <laughs> perfect. I there, love there, that I, section. I, that's yeah, one of the I, ones I really, that I had to like read it out loud so many times. It felt like acting, you know. I had to really perform that character. I was channeling my <laughs> grandfather at some point. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't that evil, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to hear that that worked. So I really love the way that um that final section kind of encapsulates all of the concerns that have come before. I'm curious, you know, this is the second book, Lizzie, that you've translated of Juan's, you know, is it is it easier the the second time around working with an author? <laughs> Not with Juan. I mean, no, no, I don't think I think that's what I love about it, though. I don't I hope it never gets easier. <laughs> <laughs>
but yeah, it's completely, completely different from the last book, and I'm excited to see what's next. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. Well, I think unless there are any last burning questions from our audience, feel free to pop those in the in the Q and A. Um, but if not, I just, you know, once again, thank everybody. Thank you to our audience for coming. Thank you, Lizzie and Juan for, uh, an excellent, excellent discussion. Um, this was absolutely lovely. Uh, as a reminder, uh, like I said, if you are east of the Mississippi, uh, and you haven't gotten your copy of the Devil of the Provinces yet, you can get it from Books and Books. If you are west of the Mississippi, third place books. Uh, both of the links to purchase the books are in the chat, uh, as well as if you feel like you missed something uh, or you know want to hear something again uh, from this uh, from this event. We've recorded this, and so you can reach out to either Third Place Books or Books and Books uh, to get a copy of the recording. But yeah, thank you so, so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you, Third Place and Books and Books, Christina and Spencer. Lovely of you to host us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I yeah, really appreciate it. It was, it was really great. Thank you very much awesome. for having All us. Right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.